factors in the back of their mind. They know that tweaking these values, such as the number of hidden layers in a deep neural net, or the number of trees in a random forest, can have a large impact on the performance of their model. But why do we really care about hyperparameters, other than just some nebulous impact on performance? This is an example from a SigOps blog post that our CEO worked on. SigOps offers an optimization service that can be used for hyperparameter optimization, and we wanted to showcase the potential of hyperparameter optimization in a machine learning setting. We built a model that decided to try to see if we could beat the house in Vegas. We were betting on an over underline for the scores of basketball games. And the idea was to have minimal feature engineering and a simple model and see what would happen with an untuned model versus a model with which we'd use SIGOPS for hyperparameter optimization. And in this example, we managed to beat the house. Using SIGOPS, well, using hyperparameter optimization was the difference between making money and losing money. And for you, using hyperparameter optimization can be the difference between the success or failure of your model. Today, I'd like to share with you tips that you can use to implement hyperparameter optimization into your current machine learning pipelines. These are best practices that we've learned from our own experience and from SIGOPS experience with customers as we've been building this optimization service. First off, I'd like to get us all on the same page with what do we mean when we say hyperparameter optimization? This concept goes under many different names. And optimization and tuning are some of the most common. And model selection is a related term that may or may not mean something very related to hyperparameter optimization. In general, we're, what we're doing is the search for the best values of hyperparameters for our model. It's this iterative process by which we kind of try out a set of configuration values. We try out a model architecture and learning rate. We try out the number of um, trees in a random forest. We try out some configuration. We evaluate our model, and then we record performance for that configuration. And then we do this again. We get another configuration for our model. We evaluate our model again, and we record some notion of performance. And now hyperparameter optimization, as you saw in the last slide, can be very effective for you if implemented correctly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go under the hood and show you three big areas for improvement with what happens at each stage of the process. When you're building a machine learning system pipeline in production, it's often the model is often just a small part of the entire system. Your machine learning model and its hyperparameters and its output are kind of this middle section of an entire system that involves things like feature extraction and often some sort of performance metric that's related to business objectives and is, and is um, related but not exactly the model's actual accuracy or error score. And so when you're thinking about tuning your model or optimizing the hyperparameters of your model, you should expand your definition. And we've seen this be very successful for our clients before to expand your definition from simply the model and its inputs and outputs to your machine learning pipeline and your machine learning pipeline's inputs and outputs as what you're trying to optimize. This is an example of a deep neural net. And in red are all of the different hyperparameters that can be tweaked. And all of these values will affect the outcome of the performance of the deep neural net. What we'll see as a, as a starting point when optimizing hyperparameters is that you'll maybe choose an architecture and then optimize the learning rate for that architecture. Ki deciding to split up the hyperparameter space into different pieces and optimize one and then optimize the other. I would encourage you to throw in all hyperparameters together and optimize all of the hyperparameters of your model at once so that you can capture latent interactions between different hyperparameters. Your space may not be convex, it may not be continual, it may not be differentiable, and it may not be easy to understand if you're trying to optimize your parameters one by one. Putting together model architecture and learning rate will allow you to see the best performance for some of these um, deep learning models, but also for other systems, you may have several different parameters that you'll want to optimize at once. Once you've decided on the hyperparameters for your model, 
There's also this notion, like I was saying before, of an entire pipeline. And this includes feature extraction, and often feature extraction involves choices. In natural language processing, you can say, be extracting n-grams from emails, and there's a choice of what's the minimum and maximum length of the n-grams I'm going to extract. Or you, may be, or you may be using a popular method like Word2Vec, and Word2Vec has a tunable parameter of learning rate. Choosing values, making choices during the feature extraction stage in kind of absence of the model is an unsupervised learning problem. It can be very difficult, or it will be very difficult to choose proper values for these, for these uh, feature extraction parameters that will help you have maximum performance for your model. And so what I would suggest is to also include the feature extraction parameters in the optimization pipeline because what you'll be able to do then is, just like in the last step, encapsulate these interactions where the number of n the minimum and maximum length of n-grams you choose may have an impact on the learning rate for, say, stochastic gradient descent. Or the learning rate for word to vec may have an impact on the number of hidden layers in your deep neural net. If you optimize the feature parameters separately from the model parameters, you won't be able to encapsulate these, these interactions. But throwing them all together and using all of these as inputs to the optimization pipeline will allow you to build a better model overall. You've chosen your inputs to this optimization process. Again, we have this idea of the optimization process as being receiving a set of hyperparameters, evaluating the model, and then recording the performance. And so now you're at the step where it's time to choose an evaluation, met choose an evaluation metric. And there's often this, kind, this notion of needing to balance say, short-term business goals and long-term business goals? Do I measure my model on accuracy, error, or some other, some other value? And I want to give you a caveat from Microsoft, when Microsoft was experimenting with a model for their search ranker. As a business unit, they decided that they wanted to increase their overall searches. Now, this is kind of a proxy measure. The idea is that they wanted their, the revenue of their search organization to go up. And they decomposed this idea and said, okay, well, we're going to train a model. And this model is going to optimize for searches per session. And so Microsoft built this model. They trained it. They tested it. They released it. And lo and behold, searches per session went up. But then someone actually decided to use the search engine and look and see what was under the hood. And what they saw is that the results were pretty bad. Why were the results bad? The model was doing exactly what it should be doing. Well, it turns out people were searching more because they couldn't find what they were looking for. And nobody told that to the model. <laughs> so um, this is just a caveat to show you what can happen if you kind of your business, your objective performance for your model is on too short of a term. And there's a couple different ways that you can build in sort of your organization's values into a performance metric for your model and avoid a situation like this. The first is you can use a composite metric. And a composite metric is something where you are taking in several different metrics and creating a scalar value. And in this example, we have lifetime value, which is a weighted linear combination of views, likes, and clicks that may be familiar to those of you in the e-commerce space. And the idea, again, is you want to produce a single scalar value from different metrics to measure the performance. And that's what your hyperparameter optimization will optimize for. Or you have another alternative. You could simply just report different, like two different competing metrics. Just report them as two different competing metrics. Hyperparameter optimization packages like SIGOPS can help you efficiently search or can help you efficiently kind of determine the optimal values for these competing metrics, leaving you with the last step to use your expert intuition to balance between things like, say, accuracy and prediction time. So imagine a young data scientist, well, a new, a fresh new data scientist, who is building one of their first models in production. They've taken a lot of this advice into account. They're optimizing their feature parameters. They've thrown in their model architecture parameters as well as their, their learning rate. They've um, chosen a metric that evaluates well, that aligns well with business objectives. 
and they've split their data into a train and a test set. And this, this new data scientist gets a set of hyperparameters, they train their model, they test their model. They get another set of hyperparameters, they train their model, they test their model. And at the end, they've got their best set of hyperparameters. Their model seems to be doing very well on their test set. They deploy their model into production and it fails. I've given it away in this slide, but <laughs> what, this, what this data scientist has done is they have overfit their model to their testing set. They haven't really improved the performance of their model overall. They've improved the performance of their model on their testing set. And their model has failed to generalize well to unseen data. So now what I'm going to share with you is I'm going to share a way to avoid overfitting and to help your model generalize. And it's known as k-fold cross-validation. And how this works is we receive a set of hyperparameters like normal. But instead of evaluating our model on one train test split, we split our data into k subsamples. We reserve subsample one for evaluation, and you train on subsamples two through k. Then you evaluate on subsample one. And then you repeat for every subsample. You reserve it for testing, train on the others, and then evaluate. At the end, your performance is not just the performance of that set of hyperparameters on one test set. It's the average performance of your model on these k different test sets. And you repeat this process for every set of hyperparameters. And this has been shown to help, this method of k-fold cross-validation has been shown to help models avoid overfitting and generalize well to unseen data. There's several different ways of you know, tweaking k-fold cross-validation. If k is equal to the number of points in your data set, you're using leave one out um, cross-validation, which, you know, if you have millions of data points, might be computationally infeasible to evaluate millions of times for every new set of hyperparameters you have. There's, al there's also stratified cross-validation in which, say, you're doing a classification problem and you have classes present with a certain ratio. You maintain those ratios in each evaluation set. And as a caveat, if you're dealing with time series data, you're going to use a class of related but not exactly the same algorithms that fall under the heading of backtesting. And there it's very important to perform multiple train test splits, but make sure that you're not using the future to predict the past. And if you have any questions about that, you can ask us later at the SIGOP booth, but I won't go into it now. So we've talked about everything that happens between when you receive a set of hyperparameters and when you report back how well your model is performing. Now let's talk about how you're actually receiving that set of hyperparameters. And the first step is to choose them yourself. The first step is to go and maybe, say, read papers or use expert intuition and try out a couple different configurations. What we've seen in practice is that this method is called hand tuning, and we've seen that it's time consuming and expensive, and that algorithms can quickly and cheaply beat expert hand tuning on problems. Within several hours, an algorithm can beat what a human has done in, say, years. There are many alternatives to hand tuning, including grid search, random search, and Bayesian optimization. And if you visited the SIGOP booth, you've seen that we have no grid search and no random search stickers. If you haven't got one, I would encourage you to pick one up after this talk. We don't like grid search because grid search suffers from the curse of dimensionality. This is a table of your kind of number of hyperparameters that you want to optimize and the number of times you're required to evaluate your model. And it is grows exponentially in the number of parameters. And this is saying that for every, you know, if you've got five hyperparameters, and you want to, in grid search, lay down a grid where you try 10 values for each of those hyperparameters, you'll have to evaluate your model 100,000 times. And if you're using k-fold cross-validation, that means you'll have to evaluate your model k <coughs> times 100,000 times. And this is computationally infeasible for many of us. And so the alternative is often to reduce the number of values per parameter that's, that's attempted but this results in a grid that is often too coarse to produce results that are any good for us. So next, um, an alternative is random search. 
random search has been shown to be theoretically more effective than grid search, which surprises me every time. But there is a large variance in results, and random search does not take advantage of learning from the past in any way to inform its next decision. You just take a random point every time and evaluate it. And there's little guidance on how many points you should pick. At SIGOMP, we recommend using Bayesian optimization. We think it's the way to go for hyperparameter optimization, and our API wraps an ensemble of Bayesian optimization techniques. Bayesian optimization offers this ideal balance of exploring your hyperparameter space and exploiting when a good point has been found. And it, Bayesian optimization is ideally suited for expensive to evaluate problems. And evaluating a machine learning model qualifies under an expensive to evaluate problem. And by expensive, I mean minutes, which in computer time is, is very expensive. But minutes or, hour, or hours or days is the length of time it may take to train a machine learning model, and that makes a method like Bayesian optimization well suited. Also, as I said before, hyperparameter spaces may be non-convex, non-continuous, non-differentiable, and Bayesian optimization makes no requirements on um, the need for anything from your, from your space of that sort. There exist alternatives to Bayesian optimization that you may have heard of before. They are available in open source packages such as particle swarm methods or genetic optimization, but we would strongly recommend using Bayesian optimization in most use cases. So I know I've moved through this a little quickly, but in conclusion, some of the takeaways that I'd like you to um, have from this talk are to expand your thinking of optimization from just optimizing your model to optimizing an entire machine learning pipeline. Use a method like k-fold cross-validation to help your model generalize and avoid overfitting. And in most cases where it's appropriate, to use Bayesian optimization to optimize the hyperparameters of your machine learning model. <coughs> and feel free to visit our blog, sigup.com research, or we'll all be at the booth later taking questions. Thank you so much for having me.